We're bringing David Schoen. He specializes in criminal defense and civil rights law, litigating in more than a dozen states. Also represented former President Trump. I am so glad that you're here with me. Because the first thing I thought of was, oh, you never reach the bar to get your trial result thrown out. That's like a, that's a pipe dream everybody has when they get a guilty verdict. This one, I feel like, like, look, I'm, you're the lawyer, but I feel like this is like a no-brainer. I think you're 100% right. I think Brian really hit on the highlights, but beyond all of that, remember they had a site visit in this case. They visited the site of the murder, and during that visit, or allegedly, this clerk met with the foreperson again privately, with whom she met many times privately, and then forbade the other jurors from asking what their conversations were about, and apparently made the comment during the site visit that this, the site visit proves that Murdoch got to be lying. Oh, so it, let's just say for a second, and I'll get to all the nitty gritty, but let's just say that the jury foreperson and this clerk became pals. And during breaks, they were having a chat about nail salons. Is that still inappropriate that they were even meeting at all, even if they had nothing to do with talking about the case? That would be inappropriate, but there are cases from South Carolina, State versus Green is a Supreme Court case from recently, South Carolina, in which they said, if it's that kind of conversation, something not about the subject matter of the case, then it may be okay. This is clearly about the subject matter of the case. As you said in your monologue, you've never heard of anything like this. I've never heard of anything like this. It's outrageous. The burden has shifted now to the prosecution after these affidavits to prove harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. They, they have to show that there's no reasonable possibility that there were, the jurors were influenced. Right. Oh, so that, I'm glad you did that. And, and I know there's a graphic up on the screen right now. I'm going to get to that in a minute. I don't want to cloud this next question. It, it's like, I'm not a lawyer. I did a law fellowship, but I don't know how you guys remember all these things. But as I understand this one, the first bar you have to meet is, was the information that you're presenting in your motion to have this trial thrown out, was it something that could not have been discovered during the trial itself? No. And the second prong is, could it actually have affected the outcome of the trial? And those are the only two prongs that need to be met in order for the judge to say, yes, this trial result does need to be tossed out. Am I missing something? Not at all. Great points. The first one's very interesting in this case. This came up during the course of the trial. It came up. There'd been possibly some improper conduct by a juror and the clerk learned about it and according to their allegations lied to the court about a Facebook post. So this there was some reason to believe there's monkey business going on with the clerk during the trial. I think now under South Carolina law uh, they have to have what's called a Remmer hearing, a famous United States Supreme Court case from 1954 bring in the jurors and hear their testimony. There's a rule, Federal Rule of Evidence 606B, South Carolina has the same rule. Ordinarily, we don't let jurors testify. We don't let them put in their mental processes and all that. The exception is if their testimony is about the improper influence of a third party. This is classic for that. And again, the burden has shifted now. The, there's a three-part test, actually. The, all the defendant has to show in this case is that either the conduct was intended to influence the juror or actually influenced it, or that the judge finds that it was probable that this would have influenced a juror. And here you have to show, the, the prosecution is going to have to show, harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, that this could not have influenced a juror. It's impossible. Got to be a new trial. It's also stinky optics. Yeah, you know? And if we're terrible. supposed to trust you know, our, our system of jurisprudence, you can't have stinky optics. So, but let me go over a couple things. So about Rebecca Hill's, the allegations against her, and the fact that she try to sway the jury not to believe the defense's case. Juror 741, uh, Hill told us not to be fooled by Murdoch's defense. Juror number 630, before he testified, Hill told us to watch him closely, look at his actions, look at his movements. Okay, maybe that on its own isn't a big deal, but here's something about the meetings that you talked about, that the juror, the foreperson, was meeting with the clerk. Juror 630 said, Hill told other jurors that they couldn't ask what the conversations were about. Juror 741, the foreperson never shared logistical information after those secret meetings. And juror 630 also said the foreperson later told other jurors that Murdoch, Murdoch was, quote, crying on cue. Okay, and then about trying to push them to reach a verdict quickly. Juror 630, uh, under the affidavit, sworn and said, Hill told us repeatedly, quote, this shouldn't take long. Juror 741, if deliberations went past 11 p.m., they'd have to go to a hotel for the night even though they didn't pack a bag. Juror number 630, six of the jurors were smokers and they were told no smoke breaks until they reached a verdict even though they had them through the trial. And then um, about the, the two walking around together at Moselle, the, the clerk and the juror foreperson, uh, Rebecca Hill wrote this in the book. 
While the jurors viewed the Moselle property, we could all we all could hear and see that Alex's story was impossible. Some of us, either from the courthouse, law enforcement, or jury at Moselle, had an epiphany and shared our thoughts with our eyes. At that moment, many of us standing there knew, I knew, and they knew that Alex was guilty. So if you share a thought with your eyes, is that something that can be construed as communicating with jurors and sharing that everyone's guilty while you're, before you've even gotten to deliberations? Yeah, s slam dunk. Almost any one of those quotes that you picked would result in a new trial. Maybe not that you're going to be here all night sort of thing, and then you're going to have to go to a hotel. That's similar to another case in which a bailiff told them they would get an Allen charge if they didn't come to conclusion, and that one wasn't overturned. That's the dynamite charge. Exactly. Go back there, do it again, work harder. Yeah, come to a yeah, verdict. Come you to know. a verdict. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's more procedural. On substance, uh, half, almost everything you said demands a new trial in this case. I'd bet on it. So, okay, so we're there with you, but can you just tell me real quickly, are they going to look at all of her other cases now? They may well do that. And she may be prosecuted for contempt. She may be prosecuted for obstruction of justice for this jury tampering. Holy Dinah, it, David. That's a lot. Okay, so you're going to have to come back as we continue Great. to see where these chips fall. Thank Always you for coming in. Nice to see you in person. Nice here. to see you. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.